Chapter One of Representative Men by Ralph Waldo Emerson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Representative Men by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Chapter One Uses of Great Men. It is natural to believe in great men. If the companions of our childhood should turn out to be heroes, and their condition regal, it would not surprise us. All mythology opens with demigods, and the circumstance is high and poetic. That is, their genius is paramount. In the legends of the Guantama, the first men ate the earth, and found it deliciously sweet. Nature seems to exist for the excellent. The world is upheld by the veracity of good men. They make the earth wholesome. They who lived with them found life glad and nutritious. Life is sweet and tolerable only in our belief in such society, and actually, or ideally, we manage to live with superiors. We call our children and our lands by their names. Their names are wrought into the verbs of language. Their works and effigies are in our houses, and every circumstance of the day recalls an anecdote of them. The search after the great is the dream of youth, and the most serious occupation of manhood. We travel into foreign parts to find his works, if possible, to get a glimpse of him. But we are put off with fortune instead. You say the English are practical. The Germans are hospitable. In Valencia, the climate is delicious, and in the hills of Sacramento there is gold for the gathering. Yes, but I do not travel to find comfortable, rich, and hospitable people, or clear sky or ingots that cost too much. But if there were any magnet that would point to the countries and houses, where are the persons who are intrinsically rich and powerful? I would sell all and buy it, and put myself on the road today. The race goes with us, on their credit. The knowledge that in the city is a man who invented the railroad raises the credit of all the citizens. But enormous populations, if they be beggars, are disgusting, like moving cheese, like hills of ants or fleas, the more the worse. Our religion is the love and cherishing of these patrons. The gods of fable are the shining moments of great men. We run all our vessels into one mold. Our colossal theologies of Judaism, Christism, Buddhism, Mahometism are the necessary and structural action of the human mind. The student of history is like a man going into a warehouse to buy cloths or carpets. He fancies he has a new article. If he go to the factory, he shall find that his new stuff still repeats the scrolls and rosettes which are found on the interior walls of the pyramids of Thebes. Our theism is the purification of the human mind. Man can paint, or make, or think nothing but man. He believes that the great material elements had their origin from his thought. And our philosophy finds one essence collected or distributed. If now we proceed to inquire into the kinds of service we derive from others, let us be warned of the danger of modern studies, and begin low enough. We must not contend against love, or deny the substantial existence of other people. I know not what would happen to us. We have social strengths. Our affection toward others creates a sort of vantage or purchase which nothing will supply. I can do that by another which I cannot do alone. I can say to you what I cannot first say to myself. Other men are lenses through which we read our own minds. Each man seeks those of different quality from his own, and such as are good of their kind. That is, he seeks other men, and the otherest. The stronger the nature, the more it is reactive. Let us have the quality pure. A little genius let us leave alone. A main difference betwixt men 
is whether they attend their own affair or not. Man is that noble, endogenous plant which grows, like the palm, from within, outward. His own affair, though impossible to others, he can open with celerity and in sport. It is easy to sugar to be sweet, and to nitre to be salt. We take a great deal of pains to waylay and entrap that which of itself will fall into our hands. I count him a great man who inhabits a higher sphere of thought, into which other men rise, with labor and difficulty. He is but to open his eyes to see things in a true light, and in large relations. Whilst they must make painful corrections, and keep a vigilant eye on many sources of error. His service to us is of like sort. It costs a beautiful person no exertion to paint her image on our eyes. Yet how splendid is that benefit! It costs no more for a wise soul to convey his quality to other men, and every one can do his best thing easiest. Peau de moyenne, peau de effet. He is great who is what he is from nature, and who never reminds us of others. But he must be related to us, and our life receive from him some promise of explanation. I cannot tell what I would know, but I have observed there are persons who, in their character and actions, answer questions which I have not skill to put. One man answers some questions which none of his contemporaries put, and is isolated. The past and passing religions and philosophies answer some other question. Certain men affect us as rich possibilities but helpless to themselves and to their times. The sport, perhaps, of some instinct that rules in the air. They do not speak to our want. But the great are near. We know them at sight. They satisfy expectation and fall into place. What is good is effective, generative. Makes for itself room, food, and allies. A sound apple produces seed, a hybrid does not. Is a man in his place? He is constructive, fertile, magnetic, inundating armies with his purpose, which is thus executed. The river makes its own shores, and each legitimate idea makes its own channels and welcome. Harvest for food, institutions for expression, weapons to fight with, and disciples to explain it. The true artist has the planet for his pedestal. The adventurer, after years of strife, has nothing broader than his own shoes. Our common discourse respects two kinds of use of service from superior men. Direct giving is agreeable to the early belief of men. Direct giving of material or metaphysical aid, as of health, eternal youth, fine senses, arts of healing, magical power and prophecy. The boy believes there is a teacher who can sell him wisdom. Churches believe in imputed merit. But in strictness, we are not much cognizant of direct serving. Man is endogenous, and education is his unfolding. The aid we have from others is mechanical, compared with the discoveries of nature in us. What is thus learned is delightful in the doing and the effect remains. Right ethics are central, and go from the soul outward. Gift is contrary to the law of the universe. Serving others is serving us. I must absolve me to myself. Mind thy fair, says the spirit, coxcomb, would you meddle with the skies or with other people? Indirect service is left. Men have a pictorial or representative quality, and serve us in the intellect. Benman and Swedenborg saw that things were representative. Men are also representative, first of things, and secondly, of ideas. As plants convert the minerals into food for animals, so each man converts some raw material in nature to human use. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, linen, silk, cotton. 
the makers of tools, the inventor of decimal notation, the geometer, the engineer, musician, severally, make an easy way for all, through unknown and impossible confusions. Each man is, by secret liking, connected with some district of nature, whose agent and interpreter he is, as Linnaeus of plants, Huber of bees, Fries of lichens, Van Mon of pears, Dalton of atomic forms, Euclid of lines, Newton of fluxions. A man is a center for nature, running out threads of relation through everything, fluid and solid, material and elemental. The earth rolls. Every clod and stone comes to the meridian. So every organ, function, acid, crystal, grain of dust, has its relation to the brain. It waits long, but its turn comes. Each plant has its parasite, and each created thing its lover and poet. Justice has already been done to steam, to iron, to wood, to coal, to lodestone, to iodine, to corn and cotton. But how few materials are yet used by our arts? The mass of creatures and of qualities are still hid and expectant. It would seem as if each waited, like the enchanted princess in fairy tales, for a destined human deliverer. Each must be disenchanted, and walk forth to the day in human shape. In the history of discovery, the ripe and latent truth seems to have fashioned a brain for itself. A magnet must be made man, in some Gilbert or Spedenborg or Orsted, before the general mind can come to entertain its powers. If we limit ourselves to the first advantages, a sober grace adheres to the mineral and botanic kingdoms, which, in the highest moments, comes up as the charm of nature. The glitter of the spar, the sureness of affinity, the veracity of angles. Light and darkness, heat and cold, hunger and food, sweet and sour, solid, liquid, and gas, circle us round in a wreath of pleasures, and by their agreeable quarrel beguile the day of life. The eye repeats every day the finest eulogy on things. He saw that they were good. We know where to find them, and these performers are relished all the more, after a little experience, of the pretending races. We are entitled also to higher advantages. Something is wanting to science until it has been humanized. The table of logarithms is one thing, and its vital play in botany, music, optics, and architecture another. There are advancements to numbers, anatomy, architecture, astronomy, little suspected at first, when by union with intellect and will they ascend into the life, and reappear in conversation, character, and politics. But this comes later. We speak now only of our acquaintance with them in their own sphere, and the way in which they seem to fascinate and draw to them some genius who occupies himself with one thing, all his life long. The possibility of interpretation lies in the identity of the observer with the observed. Each material thing has its celestial side, has its translation through humanity into the spiritual and necessary sphere where it plays a part as indestructible as any other. And to these, their ends, all things continually ascend. The gas is gathered to the solid firmament, the chemic lump arrives at the plant, and grows, arrives at the quadruped, and walks, arrives at the man, and thinks. But also the constituency determines the vote of the representative, he is not only representative, but participant. Like can only be known by like. The reason why he knows about them is that he is of them. He has just come out of nature, or from being a part of that thing. Animated chlorine knows of chlorine, and incarnate zinc of zinc. Their quality makes this career, and he can variously publish their virtues, 
because they compose him. Man, made of the dust of the world, does not forget his origin, and all that is yet inanimate will one day speak and reason. Unpublished nature will have its whole secret told. Shall we say that quartz mountains will pulverize into innumerable Werners, von Buchs, and Beaumonts, and the laboratory of the atmosphere, hold in solution, I know not what, Berzeliuses and Davies. Thus we sit by the fire, and take hold on the poles of the earth. This quasi-omnipresence supplies the imbecility of our condition. In one of those celestial days, when heaven and earth meet and adorn each other, it seems a poverty that we can only spend at once. We wish for a thousand heads, a thousand bodies, that we might celebrate its immense beauty in many ways and places. Is this fancy? Well, in good faith we are multiplied by our proxies. How easily we adopt their labors. Every ship that comes to America got its chart from Columbus. Every novel is debtor to Homer. Every carpenter who shaves with the foreplane borrows the genius of a forgotten inventor. Life is girt all around with a zodiac of sciences, the contributions of men who have perished to add their point of light to our sky. Engineer, broker, jurist, physician, moralist, theologian, and every man, inasmuch as he has any science, is a definer and map-maker of the latitudes and longitudes of our condition. These road-makers, on every hand, enrich us. We must extend the area of life and multiply our relations. We are as much gainers by finding a new property in the old earth as by acquiring a new planet. We are too passive in the reception of these material or semi-material aids. We must not be sacks and stomachs. To ascend one step, we are better served through our sympathy. Activity is contagious. Looking where others look, and conversing with the same things, we catch the charm which lured them. Napoleon said, You must not fight too often with one enemy, or you will teach him all your art of war. Talk much with any man of vigorous mind, and we can acquire very fast the habit of looking at things in the same light, and, on each occurrence, we anticipate his thought. Men are helpful through the intellect and the affections. Other help, I find a false appearance. If you affect to give me bread and fire, I perceive that I pay for it the full price, and at last it leaves me as it found me, neither better nor worse. But all mental and moral force is a positive good. It goes out from you, whether you will or not, and profits me, whom you never thought of. I cannot even hear of personal vigor of any kind, great power of performance, without fresh resolution. We are emulous of all that man can do. Cecil saying of Sir Walter Raleigh, I know that he can toil terribly, is an electric touch. So are Clarendon's portraits of Hampton, who was of an industry and vigilance not to be tired out or wearied by the most laborious, and of parts not to be imposed on by the most subtle and sharp, and of a personal courage equal to his best parts. A Falkland, who was so severe an adorer of truth, that he could as easily have given himself leave to steal as to dissemble. We cannot read Plutarch without a tingling of the blood, and I accept the saying of the Chinese Mencius, as age is the instructor of a hundred ages. When the manners of Lu are heard of, the stupid become intelligent, and the wavering determined. This is the moral of biography. Yet it is hard for departed men to touch the quick, like our own companions, whose names may not last as long. What is he whom I never think of? Whilst in every solitude are those who succor our genius, and stimulate us in wonderful manners, there is a power in love to divine another's destiny 
better than that other can, and by heroic encouragements hold him to his task. What is friendship so signaled as its sublime attraction to whatever virtue is in us? We will never more think cheaply of ourselves or our life. We are piqued to some purpose, and the industry of the diggers on the railroad will not again shame us. Under this head, too, falls that homage, very pure as I think, which all ranks pay to the hero of the day, from Coriolanus and Gracchus down to Pitt, Lafayette, Wellington, Webster, Lamartine. Hear the shouts in the street. The people cannot see him enough. They delight in a man. Here is a head and a trunk. What a front! What eyes! Atlantean shoulders, and the whole carriage heroic, with equal inward force to guide the great machine. This pleasure of full expression to that which, in their private experience, is usually cramped and obstructed, runs also much higher, and is the secret of the reader's joy in literary genius. Nothing is kept back. There is fire enough to fuse the mountain of ore. Shakespeare's principal merit may be conveyed in saying that he, of all men, best understands the English language, and can say what he will. Yet these unchoked channels and floodgates of expression are only health or fortunate constitution. Shakespeare's name suggests other and purely intellectual benefits. Senates and sovereigns have no compliment, with their medals, swords, and armorial coats, like the addressing to a human being, thoughts out of a certain height, and presupposing his intelligence. This honor, which is possible in personal intercourse, scarcely twice in a lifetime, genius perpetually pays, contented, if now and then, in a century, the proffer is accepted. The indicators of the values of matter are degraded to a sort of cooks and confectioners on the appearance of the indicators of ideas. Genius is the naturalist, or geographer, of the supersensible regions, and draws on their map, and, by acquainting us with new fields of activity, cools our affection for the old. These are at once accepted as the reality, of which the world we have conversed with is the show. We go to the gymnasium and the swimming school to see the power and beauty of the body. There is the like pleasure and a higher benefit from witnessing intellectual feats of all kinds, as feats of memory, of mathematical combination, great power of abstraction, the transmutings of the imagination, even versatility and concentration, as these acts expose the invisible organs and members of the mind, which respond member for member to the parts of the body. For we thus enter a new gymnasium, and learn to choose men by their truest marks, taught, with Plato, to choose those who can, without aid from the eyes, or any other sense, proceed to truth and to being. Foremost among these activities are the somersaults, spells, and resurrections, wrought by the imagination. With this wakes a man seems to multiply ten times or a thousand times his force, it opens the delicious sense of indeterminate size, and inspires an audacious mental habit. We are as elastic as the gas of gunpowder, and a sentence in a book, or a word dropped in conversation, sets free our fancy, and instantly our heads are bathed with galaxies, and our feet tread the floor of the pit. And this benefit is real, because we are entitled to these enlargements and, once having passed the bounds, shall never again be quite the miserable pedants we were. The high functions of the intellect are so allied, that some imaginative power usually appears in all eminent minds, even in arithmeticians of the first class, but especially in meditative men of intuitive habit of thought. This class serve us, so that they have the perception of identity and the perception of reaction. The eyes of Plato, Shakespeare, Swedenborg, Goethe, never shut on either of these laws. The perception of these laws is a kind of meter of the mind. 
little minds are little through failure to see them even these feasts have their surfeit our delight in reason degenerates into idolatry of the herald especially when a mind of powerful method has instructed men we find the examples of oppression the dominion of aristotle the ptolemaic astronomy the credit of luther of bacon of locke in religion the history of hierarchies of saints and the sects which have taken the name of each founder are in point alas every man is such a victim the imbecility of men is always inviting the impudence of power it is the delight of vulgar talent to dazzle and to bind the beholder but true genius seeks to defend us from itself true genius will not impoverish but will liberate and add new senses if a wise man should appear in our village he would create in those who converse with him a new consciousness of wealth by opening their eyes to unobserved advantages he would establish a sense of immovable equality calm us with assurances that we could not be cheated as every one would discern the checks and guarantees of condition the rich would see their mistakes and poverty the poor their escapes and their resources but nature brings all this about in due time rotation is her remedy the soul is impatient of masters and eager for change housekeepers say of a domestic who has been valuable she has lived with me long enough we are tendencies or rather symptoms and none of us complete we touch and go and sip the foam of many lives rotation is the law of nature when nature removes a great man people explore the horizon for a successor but none comes and none will his class is extinguished with him in some other and quite different field the next man will appear not jefferson nor franklin but now a great salesman then a road contractor then a student of fishes then a buffalo hunting explorer or a semi-savage western general thus we make a stand against our rougher masters but against the best there is a finer remedy the power which they communicate is not theirs when we are exalted by ideas we do not owe this to plato but to the idea to which also plato was debtor i must not forget that we have a special debt to a single class life is a scale of degrees between rank and rank of our great men are wide intervals mankind have in all ages attached themselves to a few persons who either by the quality of that idea they embodied or by the largeness of their reception were entitled to the position of leaders and lawgivers these teach us the qualities of primary nature admit us to the constitution of things we swim day by day on a river of delusions and are effectually amused with houses and towns in the air of which the men about us are dupes but life is a sincerity in lucid intervals we say let there be an entrance open for me into realities i have worn the fool's cap too long we will know the meaning of our economies in politics give us a cipher and if persons and things are scores of a celestial music let us read off the strains we have been cheated of our reason yet there have been sane men who enjoyed a rich and related existence what they know they know for us with each new mind a new secret of nature transpires nor can the bible be closed until the last great man is born these men correct the delirium of the animal spirits make us considerate and engage us to new aims and powers the veneration of mankind selects these for the highest place witness the multitude of statues pictures and memorials which recall their genius in every city village house and ship ever their phantoms rise before us our loftier brothers but one in blood at bed and table they lord it o'er us with looks of beauty and words of good how to illustrate the distinctive benefit of ideas 
the service rendered by those who introduce moral truths into the general mind. I am plagued in all my living with the perpetual tariff of prices. If I work in my garden and prune an apple tree, I am well enough entertained and could continue indefinitely in the like occupation. But it comes to mind that a day is gone and I have got this precious nothing done. I go to Boston or New York and run up and down on my affairs. They are sped, but so is the day. I am vexed by the recollection of this price I have paid for a trifling advantage. I remember the podon, on which whoso sat should have his desire, but a piece of the skin was gone for every wish. I go to a convention of philanthropists. Do what I can, I cannot keep my eyes off the clock. But if there should appear in the company some gentle soul, who knows little of persons or parties, of Carolina or Cuba, but who announces a law that disposes these particulars, and so certifies me of the equity which checkmates every false player, bankrupts every self-seeker, and apprises me of my independence on any conditions of country, or time, or human body, that man liberates me. I forget the clock. I pass out of the sore relation to persons. I am healed of my hurts. I am made immortal by apprehending my possession of incorruptible goods. Here is great competition of rich and poor. We live in a market where is only so much wheat or wool or land. And if I have so much more, every other must have so much less. I seem to have no good without breach of good manners. Nobody is glad in the gladness of another, and our system is one of war, of an injurious superiority. Every child of the Saxon race is educated to wish to be first. It is our system, and a man comes to measure his greatness by the regrets, envies, and hatreds of his competitors. But in these new fields there is room. Here are no self-esteems, no exclusions. I admire great men of all classes, those who stand for facts and for thoughts. I like rough and smooth, scourges of God, and darlings of the human race. I like the first Caesar, and Charles V of Spain, and Charles XII of Sweden, Richard Plantagenet, and Bonaparte in France. I applaud a sufficient man, an officer, equal to his office, captains, ministers, senators. I like a master standing firm on legs of iron, well-born, rich, handsome, eloquent, loaded with advantages, drawing all men by fascination into tributaries and supporters of his power. Sword and staff, or talents sword-like or staff-like, carry on the work of the world. But I find him greater when he can abolish himself, and all heroes, by letting in this element of reason, irrespective of persons. This subtilizer and irresistible upward force into our thought, destroying individualism. The power so great that the potentate is nothing. Then he is a monarch, who gives a constitution to his people, a pontiff, who preaches the equality of souls, and releases his servants from their barbarous homages, an emperor who can spare his empire. But I intended to specify, with a little minuteness, two or three points of service. Nature never spares the opium, or nepenthe, but wherever she mars her creature with some deformity or defect, lays her poppies plentifully on the bruise, and the sufferer goes joyfully through life, ignorant of the ruin, and incapable of seeing it, though all the world point their finger at it every day. The worthless and offensive members of society, whose existence is a social pest, invariably think themselves the most ill-used people alive, and never get over their astonishment at the ingratitude and selfishness of their contemporaries. Our globe discovers its hidden virtues, not only in heroes and archangels, but in gossips and nurses. Is it not a rare contrivance that lodge the due inertia in every creature, the conserving, resisting energy, the anger at being waked or changed? Altogether independent of the intellectual force in each, 
is the pride of opinion, the security that we are right. Not the feeblest grandam, not a mowing idiot, but uses what spark of perception and faculty is left to chuckle and triumph in his or her opinion over the absurdities of all the rest. Difference from me is the measure of absurdity. Not one has a misgiving of being wrong. Was it not a bright thought that made things cohere with this bitumen, fastest of cements? But in the midst of this chuckle of self-gratulation, some figure goes by, which Thersides, too, can love and admire. This is he that should marshal us the way we were going. There is no end to his aid. Without Plato, we should almost lose our faith in the possibility of a reasonable book. We seem to want but one, but we want one. We love to associate with heroic persons, since our receptivity is unlimited, and with the great, our thoughts and manners easily become great. We are all wise in capacity, though so few in energy. There needs but one wise man in a company, and all are wise, so rapid is the contagion. Great men are thus a clearium to clear our eyes from egotism, and enable us to see other people and their works. But there are vices and follies incident to whole populations and ages. Men resemble their contemporaries even more than their progenitors. It is observed in old couples, or in persons who have been housemates for a course of years, that they grow alike. If they should live long enough, we should not be able to know them apart. Nature abhors these complacences, which threaten to melt the world into a lump, and hastens to break up such maudlin agglutinations. The like assimilation goes on between men of one town, of one sect, of one political party, and the ideas of the time are in the air, and infect all who breathe it. Viewed from any high point, the city of New York, yonder city of London, the western civilization, would seem a bundle of insanities. We keep each other in countenance and exasperate, by emulation, the frenzy of the time. The shield against the stingings of conscience is the universal practice of our contemporaries. Again, it is very easy to be as wise and good as your companions. We learn of our contemporaries what they know without effort, and almost through the pores of the skin. We catch it by sympathy, or as a wife arrives at the intellectual and moral elevations of her husband. But we stop where they stop. Very hardly can we take another step. The great, or such as hold of nature, and transcend fashions, by their fidelity to universal ideas, are saviors from these federal errors, and defend us from our contemporaries. They are the exceptions which we want, where all grows alike. A foreign greatness is the antidote for capitalism. Thus we feed on genius, and refresh ourselves from too much conversation with our mates, and exult in the depth of nature in that direction in which he leads us. What indemnification is one great man for populations of pygmies? Every mother wishes one son a genius, though all the rest should be mediocre. But a new danger appears in the excess of influence of the great man. His attractions warp us from our place. We have become underlings and intellectual suicides. Ah, yonder in the horizon is our help. Other great men, new qualities, counterweights and checks on each other. We cloy of the honey of each peculiar greatness. Every hero becomes a bore at last. Perhaps Voltaire was not bad-hearted, yet he said of the good Jesus even, I pray you, let me never hear that man's name again. They cry of the virtues of George Washington. Damn George Washington is the poor Jacobin's whole speech and computation. But it is human nature's indispensable defense. The centripetence augments the centrifugence. We balance one man with his opposite, and the health of the state depends on the seesaw. There is, however, a speedy limit to the use of heroes. Every genius is defended from approach by quantities of availableness. 
They are very attractive, and seem at a distance our own, but we are hindered on all sides from approach. The more we are drawn, the more we are repelled. There is something not solid in the good that is done for us. The best discovery the discoverer makes for himself. It has something unreal for his companion, until he too has substantiated it. It seems as if the deity dressed each soul which he sends into nature in certain virtues and powers not communicable to other men, and sending it to perform one more turn through the circle of beings, wrote, not transferable, and good for this trip only, on these garments of the soul. There is somewhat deceptive about the intercourse of minds. The boundaries are invisible, but they are never crossed. There is such good will to impart, and such good will to receive, that each threatens to become the other. But the law of individuality collects each secret strength. You are you, and I am I, and so we remain. For nature wishes everything to remain itself, and whilst every individual strives to grow and exclude, and to exclude and grow, to the extremities of the universe, and to impose the law of its being on every other creature, Nature steadily aims to protect each against every other. Each is self-defended. Nothing is more marked than the power by which individuals are guarded from individuals. In a world where every benefactor becomes so easily a malefactor, only by continuation of his activity into places where it is not due, where children seem so much at the mercy of their foolish parents, and where almost all men are too social and interfering. We rightly speak of the guardian angels of children. How superior in their security from infusions of evil persons, from vulgarity and second thought. They shed their own abundant beauty on the objects they behold. Therefore, they are not at the mercy of such poor educators as we adults. If we huff and chide them, they soon come not to mind it, and get a self-reliance, and if we indulge them to folly, they learn the limitation elsewhere. We need not fear excessive influence. A more generous trust is permitted. Serve the great. Stick at no humiliation. Grudge no office thou canst render. Be the limb of their body, the breath of their mouth. Compromise thy egotism. Who cares for that, so thou gain aught wider and nobler? Never mind the taunt of Boswellism. The devotion may easily be greater than the wretched pride which is guarding its own skirts. Be another, not thyself, but a Platonist, not a soul, but a Christian, not a naturalist, but a Cartesian, not a poet, but a Shakespearean. In vain, the wheels of tendency will not stop, nor will all the forces of inertia, fear, or love itself, hold thee there. On, and forever onward, the microscope observes a monad, or wheel insect, among the infusories circulating in water. Presently, a dot appears on the animal, which enlarges to a slit, and it becomes two perfect animals. The ever-proceeding detachment appears not less in all thought, and in society. Children think they cannot live without their parents, but, long before they are aware of it, the black dot has appeared, and the detachment taken place. Any accident will now reveal to them their independence. But great men, the word is injurious. Is their caste, is their fate? What becomes of the promise to virtue? The thoughtful youth laments the superfotation of nature. Generous and handsome, he says, is your hero, but look at yonder poor Paddy, whose country is his wheelbarrow. Look at his whole nation of Paddies. Why are the masses, from the dawn of history down, food for knives and powder? The idea dignifies a few leaders, who have sentiment, opinion, love, self-devotion, and they make war and death sacred. But what for the wretches whom they hire and kill? The cheapness of man is every day's tragedy. It is as real a loss that others should be low, as that we should be low, for we must have society. Is it a reply to these suggestions, to say society is a Pestalozian school? 
all our teachers and pupils in turn. We are equally served by receiving and by imparting. Men who know the same things are not long the best company for each other, but bring to each an intelligent person of another experience, and it is as if you let off water from a lake by cutting a lower basin. It seems a mechanical advantage, and great benefit it is to each speaker, as he can now paint out his thought to himself. We pass very fast in our personal moods from dignity to dependence, and if any appear never to assume the chair, but always to stand and serve, it is because we do not see the company in a sufficiently long period for the whole rotation of parts to come about. As to what we call the masses and common men, there are no common men. All men are at last of a size, and true art is only possible on the conviction that every talent has its apotheosis somewhere. Fair play, and an open field, and freshest laurels to all who have won them. But heaven reserves an equal scope for every creature. Each is uneasy, until he has produced his private ray onto the concave sphere, and beheld his talent also in his last nobility and exaltation. The heroes of the hour are relatively great, of a faster growth, or they are such in whom, at the moment of success, a quality is ripe which is then in request. Other days will demand other qualities. Some rays escape the common observer, and want a finely adapted eye. Ask the great man if there be none greater. His companions are, and not the less great, but the more, that society cannot see them. Nature never send a great man into the planet without confiding the secret to another soul. One gracious fact emerges from these studies, that there is true ascension in our love. The reputations of the nineteenth century will one day be quoted to prove its barbarism. The genius of humanity is the real subject whose biography is written in our annals. We must infer much, and supply many chasms in the record. The history of the universe is symptomatic, and life is mnemonical. No man, in all the procession of famous men, is reason or illumination, or that essence we were looking for, but is an exhibition, in some quarter, of new possibilities. Could we one day complete the immense figure which those flagrant points compose? The study of many individuals leads us to an elemental region wherein the individual is lost, or wherein all touch by their summits. Thought and feeling, that break out there, cannot be impounded by any fence of personality. This is the key to the power of the greatest men. Their spirit diffuses itself. A new quality of mind travels by night and by day, in concentric circles from its origin, and publishes itself by unknown methods. The union of all minds appears intimate. What gets admission to one cannot be kept out of any other. The smallest acquisition of truth or of energy, in any quarter, is so much good to the commonwealth of souls. If the disparities of talent and position vanish, when the individuals are seen in the duration which is necessary to complete the career of each, even more swiftly the seeming injustice disappears when we ascend to the central identity of all the individuals, and know that they are made of the same substance which ordaineth and doeth. The genius of humanity is the right point of view of history. The qualities abide, the men who exhibit them, have now more, now less, and pass away. The qualities remain on another brow. No experience is more familiar. Once you saw phoenixes, they are gone, the world is not therefore disenchanted. The vessels on which you read sacred emblems turn out to be common pottery, but the sense of the pictures is sacred, and you may still read them transferred to the walls of the world. For a time our teachers serve us personally as meters or milestones of progress. Once they were angels of knowledge, and their figures touched the sky. Then we drew near, saw their means, culture, and limits, and they yielded their places to other geniuses. Happy, if a few names remain so high, that we have not been able to read them nearer, 
and age in comparison have not robbed them of array but at last we shall cease to look in men for completeness and shall content ourselves with their social and delegated quality all that respects the individual is temporary and prospective like the individual himself who is ascending out of his limits into a catholic existence we have never come at the true and best benefit of any genius so long as we believe him an original force in the moment when he ceases to help us as a cause he begins to help us move as an effect then he appears as an exponent of a vaster mind and will the opaque self becomes transparent with the light of the first cause yet within the limits of human education and agency we may say great men exist that there may be greater men the destiny of organized nature is amelioration and who can tell its limits it is for man to tame the chaos on every side whilst he lives to scatter the seeds of science and of song that climate corn animals men may be milder and the germs of love and benefit may be multiplied end chapter one Two, Plato, or the Philosopher, of Representative Men, by Ralph Waldo Emerson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, Plato, or the Philosopher. Among books, Plato only is entitled to Omar's fanatical compliment to the Koran, when he said, "Burn the libraries, for their value is in this book." these sentences contain the culture of nations these are the cornerstone of schools these are the fountainhead of literatures a discipline it is in logic arithmetic taste symmetry poetry language rhetoric ontology morals or practical wisdom there was never such range of speculation out of plato come all things that are still written and debated among men of thought great havoc makes he among our originalities we have reached the mountain from which all these drift boulders were detached the bible of the learned for twenty-two hundred years every brisk young man who says in succession fine things to each reluctant generation bothius rabelais erasmus bruno locke rousseau alfieri coleridge is some reader of plato translating into the vernacular wittily his good things even the men of grander proportion suffer some deduction from the misfortune shall i say of coming after this exhausting generalizer st augustine copernicus newton bayman swedenborg goethe are likewise his debtors and must say after him for it is fair to credit the broadest generalizer with all the particulars deducible from his thesis plato is philosophy and philosophy plato at once the glory and the shame of mankind since neither saxon nor roman have availed to add any idea to his categories no wife no children had he and the thinkers of all civilized nations are his posterity and are tinged with his mind how many great men nature is incessantly sending up out of night to be his men platonist the alexandrians a constellation of genius the elizabethans not less sir thomas more henry more john hales john smith lord bacon jeremy taylor ralph cutworth sydenham thomas taylor marsilius ficinus and picus mirandola calvinism is in his phaedo christianity is in it mahometanism draws all its philosophy in its handbook of morals the o'clock e ahali from him mysticism finds in plato all its texts the citizen of a town in greece is no villager nor patriot an englishman reads and says how english 
a German, how Teutonic, an Italian, how Roman and how Greek. As they say that Helen of Argus had that universal beauty that everybody felt related to her, so Plato seems to a reader in New England an American genius. His broad humanity transcends all sectional lines. This range of Plato instructs us what to think of the vexed question concerning his reputed works, what are genuine, what spurious. It is singular that wherever we find a man higher, by a whole head, than any of his contemporaries, it is sure to come into doubt what are his real works. Thus Homer, Plato, Raphael, Shakespeare. For these men magnetize their contemporaries, so that their companions can do for them what they can never do for themselves. And the great man does thus live in several bodies, and write or paint or act by many hands. And after some time, it is not easy to say what is the authentic work of the master, and what is only of his school. Plato, too, like every great man, consumed his own times. What is a great man but one of great affinities, who takes up into himself all arts, sciences, all knowables as his food. He can spare nothing. He can dispose of everything. What is not good for virtue is good for knowledge. Hence his contemporaries tax him with plagiarism. But the inventor only knows how to borrow, and society is glad to forget the innumerable laborers who ministered to this architect and reserved all its gratitude for him. When we are praising Plato, it seems we are praising quotations from Solon and Saffron and Philolaus. But it is so. Every book is a quotation, and every house is a quotation out of all forests and mines and stone quarries. And every man is a quotation from all his ancestors. And this grasping inventor puts all nations under contribution. Plato absorbed the learning of his times. Philolaus, Timaeus, Heraclitus, Perimides, and what else? And then his master, Socrates, and finding himself still capable of a larger synthesis, beyond all example then or since, he traveled into Italy to gain what Pythagoras had for him, and then into Egypt, and perhaps still further east, to import the other element, which Europe wanted, into the European mind. This breath entitles him to stand as a representative of philosophy. He says in the Republic, such a genius as philosophers must of necessity have, is wont but seldom, in all its parts, to meet in one man. But its different parts generally spring up in different persons. Every man who would do anything well must come to it from a higher ground. A philosopher must be more than a philosopher. Plato is clothed with the powers of a poet, stands upon the highest place of the poet, and, though I doubt he wanted the decisive gift of lyric expression, mainly is not a poet, because he chose to use the poetic gift to an ulterior purpose. Great geniuses have the shortest biographies. Their cousins can tell you nothing about them. They lived in their writings, and so their house and street life was trivial and commonplace. If you would know their tastes and complexions, the most admiring of their readers most resembles them. Plato especially has no external biography. If he had lover, wife, or children, we hear nothing of them. He ground them all into paint. As a good chimney burns its smoke, so a philosopher converts the value of all his fortunes into his intellectual performances. He was born 430 A.C., about the time of the death of Pericles, was of patrician connection, in his times and city, and is said to have had an early inclination for war. But in his twentieth year, meeting with Socrates, was easily dissuaded from this pursuit and remained for ten years his scholar, until the death of Socrates. He then went to Megara, accepted the invitations of Dion and Dionysius, 
to the court of Sicily, and went thither three times, though very capriciously treated. He travelled into Italy, then into Egypt, where he stayed a long time, some say three, some say thirteen years. It is said he went farther, into Babylonia. This is uncertain. Returning to Athens, he gave lessons in the academy to those whom his fame drew thither, and died, as we have received it, in the act of writing, at eighty-one years. But the biography of Plato is interior. We are to account for the supreme elevation of this man in the intellectual history of our race. How it happens that, in proportion to the culture of men, they become his scholars, that, as our Jewish Bible has implanted itself in the table-talk, and household life of every man and woman in the European and American nations, so the writings of Plato have preoccupied every school of learning, every lover of thought, every church, every poet, making it impossible to think, on certain levels, except through him. He stands between the truth and every man's mind, and his almost impressed language, and the primary forms of thought, with his name and seal. I am struck in reading him, with the extreme modernness of his style and spirit. Here is the germ of that Europe we know so well, in its long history of arts and arms. Here are all its traits, already discernible, in the mind of Plato, and in none before him. It has spread itself since into a hundred histories, but has added no new element. This perpetual modernness, in the measure of merit, in every work of art, since the author of it was not misled by anything short-lived or local, but abode by real and abiding traits. How Plato came thus to be Europe, and philosophy, and almost literature, is the problem for us to solve. This could not have happened without a sound, sincere, and Catholic man, able to honor, at the same time, the ideal or laws of the mind, and fate, or the order of nature. The first period of a nation, as of an individual, is a period of unconscious strength. Children cry, scream, and stamp with fury, unable to express their desires. As soon as they can speak and tell their want, and the reason of it, they become gentle. In adult life, whilst the perceptions are obtuse, men and women talk vehemently and superlatively, blunder and quarrel. Their manners are full of desperation, their speech is full of oaths. As soon as, with culture, things have cleared up a little, and they see them no longer in lumps and masses, but accurately distributed, they desist from that weak vehemence and explain their meaning in detail. If the tongue had not been framed for articulation, man would still be a beast in the forest. The same weakness and want, on a higher plane, occurs daily in the education of ardent young men and women. Ah, you don't understand me. I've never met with anyone who comprehends me. And they sigh and weep, write verses, and walk alone fault of power to express their precise meaning. In a month or two, through the favor of their good genius, they meet someone so related as to assist their volcanic estate, and, good communication being once established, they are thenceforward good citizens. It is ever thus, the progress is to accuracy, to skill, to truth, from blind force, there is a moment in the history of every nation when, proceeding out of this brute youth, the perceptive powers reach their ripeness, and have not yet become microscopic, so that man, at that instant, extends across the entire scale, and, with his feet still planted on the immense forces of night, converses, by his eyes and brain, with solar and stellar creation. That is the moment of adult health, the culmination of power. Such is the history of Europe, in all points, and such in philosophy. Its early records, almost perished, are of the immigrations from Asia, bringing with them the dreams of barbarians, a confusion of crude notions of morals, and of natural philosophy, gradually subsiding, 
through the partial insight of single teachers. Before Pericles came the seven wise masters, and we have the beginnings of geometry, metaphysics, and ethics. Then the partialists, deducing the origin of things from flux or water, or from air, or from fire, or from mind. All mix with these causes mythologic pictures. At last comes Plato, the distributor, who needs no barbaric paint, or tattoo, or whooping, for he can define. He leaves with Asia the vast and superlative. He is the arrival of accuracy and intelligence. He shall be as a god to me, who can rightly divide and define. This defining is philosophy. Philosophy is the account which the human mind gives to itself of the constitution of the world. Two cardinal facts lie forever at the base, the one and the two. One, unity or identity, and two, variety. We unite all things by perceiving the law which pervades them, by perceiving the superficial differences and the profound resemblances. But every mental act, this very perception of identity or oneness, recognizes the difference of things. Oneness and otherness. It is impossible to speak or to think without embracing both. The mind is urged to ask for one cause of many effects, then for the cause of that, and again the cause, diving still into the profound, self-assured that it shall arrive at an absolute and sufficient one, a one that shall be all. In the midst of the sun is the light, in the midst of the light is truth, and in the midst of truth is the imperishable being, say the Vedas. All philosophy, of East and West, has the same centripetence. Urged by an opposite necessity, the mind returns from the one to that which is not one, but other or many, from cause to effect, and affirms the necessary existence of variety, the self-existence of both, as each is involved in the other. These strictly blended elements, it is the problem of thought to separate and to reconcile. Their existence is mutually contradictory and exclusive, and each so fast lies into the other that we can never say what is one and what is not. The Proteus is as nimble in the highest as in the lowest grounds, when we contemplate the one, the true, the good, as in the surfaces and extremities of matter. In all nations, there are minds which incline to dwell on the conception of the fundamental unity. The raptures of prayer and ecstasy of devotion lose all being in one being. This tendency finds its highest expression in the religious writings of the East, and chiefly in the Indian scriptures, in the Vedas, the Bhagat Gita, and Vishnu Purana. Those writings contain little else than this idea, and they rise to pure and sublime strains in celebrating it. The same, the same, friend and foe are of one stuff, the plowman, the plough, and the furrow are of one stuff, and the stuff is such and so much that the variations of forms are unimportant. You are fit, says the supreme Krishna to a sage to apprehend that you are not distinct from me. That which I am, thou art, and that also is this word, with its gods and heroes and mankind. Men contemplate distinctions because they are stupefied with ignorance. The words I and mine constitute ignorance. What is the great end of all, you shall now learn from me. It is soul, one in all bodies, pervading, uniform, perfect, preeminent over nature, exempt from birth, growth, and decay, omnipresent, made up of true knowledge, independent, unconnected with unrealities, with name, species, and the rest, in time past, present, and to come. The knowledge that this spirit, which is essentially one, is in one's own, and in all other bodies, is the wisdom of one who knows the unity of things. 
as one diffusive air passing through the perforations of a flute is distinguished as the notes of a scale so the nature of the great spirit is single though its forms be manifold arising from the consequences of acts when the difference of the investing form as that of god or the rest is destroyed there is no distinction the whole world is but a manifestation of vishnu who is identical with all things and is to be regarded by the wise as not differing from but as the same as themselves i neither am going nor coming nor is my dwelling in any one place nor art thou thou nor are others others nor am i i as if he had said all is for the soul and the soul is vishnu and animals and stars are transient painting and light is whitewash and durations are deceptive and form is imprisonment and heaven itself a decoy that which the soul seeks is resolution into being above form out of tartarus and out of heaven liberation from nature if speculation tends thus to a terrific unity in which all things are absorbed action tends directly backwards to diversity the first is the course of gravitation of mind the second is the power of nature nature is the manifold the unity absorbs and melts or reduces nature opens and creates these two principles reappear and interpenetrate all things all thought the one the many one is being the other intellect one is necessity the other freedom one rest the other motion one power the other distribution one strength the other pleasure one consciousness the other definition one genius the other talent one earnestness the other knowledge one possession the other trade one caste the other culture one king the other democracy and if we dare carry these generalizations a step higher and name the last tendency of both we might say that the end of the one is escape from organization pure science and the end of the other is the highest instrumentality or use of means or executive deity each student adheres by temperament and by habit to the first or to the second of these gods of the mind by religion he tends to unity by intellect or by the senses to the many a too rapid unification and an excessive appliance to parts and particulars are the twin dangers of speculation to this partiality the history of nations corresponded the country of unity of immovable institutions the seat of a philosophy delighting in abstractions of men faithful in doctrine and in practice to the idea of a deaf unimplorable immense fate is asia and it realizes this fate in the social institution of caste on the other side the genius of europe is active and creative it resists caste by culture its philosophy was a discipline it is a land of arts inventions trade freedom if the east loved infinity the west delighted in boundaries european civility is the triumph of talent the extension of system the sharpened understanding adaptive skill delight in forms delight in manifestation in comprehensible results pericles athens greece had been working in this element with the joy of genius not yet chilled by any foresight of the detriment of an excess they saw before them no sinister political economy no ominous malthus no paris or london no pitiless subdivision of classes the doom of the pinmakers the doom of the weavers of dressers of stockingers of carters of spinners of colliers no ireland 
no Indian caste, superinduced by the efforts of Europe to throw it off. The understanding was in its health and prime. Art was in its splendid novelty. They cut the Pentelican marble, as if it were snow, and their perfect works in architecture and sculpture seemed things, of course, not more difficult than the completion of a new ship at the Medford Yards, or new mills at Lowell. These things are in course, and may be taken for granted. The Roman Legion, Byzantine legislation, English trade, the saloons of Versailles, the cafés of Paris, the steam-mill, steamboat, steam-coach, may all be seen in perspective. The town meeting, the ballot-box, the newspaper and cheap press. Meantime, Plato in Egypt, and in Eastern pilgrimages, imbibe the idea of one deity, in which all things are absorbed. The unity of Asia and the detail of Europe, the infinitude of the Asiatic soul, and the defining, result-loving, machine-making, surface-seeking, opera-going Europe. Plato came to join, and by contact, to enhance the energy of each. The excellence of Europe and Asia are in his brain. Metaphysics and natural philosophy express the genius of Europe. He substructs the religion of Asia as the base. In short, a balanced soul was born, perceptive of the two elements. It is as easy to be great as to be small. The reason why we do not at once believe in admirable souls is because they are not in our experience. In actual life they are so rare as to be incredible. But primarily, there is not only no presumption against them, but the strongest presumption in favor of their appearance. But whether voices were heard in the sky or not, whether his mother or his father dreamed that the infant man-child was the son of Apollo, whether a swarm of bees settled on his lips or not, a man who could see two sides of a thing was born. The wonderful synthesis, so familiar in nature, the upper and the under side of the metal of Jove, the union of impossibilities, which reappears in every object, its real and its ideal power, was now also transferred entire to the consciousness of a man. The balanced soul came. If he loved abstract truth, he saved himself by propounding the most popular of all principles, the absolute good, which rules rulers and judges the judge. If he made transcendental distinctions, he fortified himself by drawing all his illustrations from sources disdained by orators and polite conversers, from mares and puppies, from pitchers and soup ladles, from cooks and criers, the shops of potters, horse doctors, butchers, and fishmongers. He cannot forgive in himself a partiality but is resolved that the two poles of thought shall appear in his statement. His arguments and his sentences are self-poised and spherical. The two poles appear, yes, and become two hands, to grasp and appropriate their own. Every great artist has been such by synthesis. Our strength is transitional, alternating, or shall I say, a thread of two strands. The seashore, sea seen from shore, shore seen from sea. The taste of two metals in contact, and our enlarged powers at the approach and at the departure of a friend. The experience of poetic creativeness, which is not found in staying at home, nor yet in traveling, but in transitions from one to the other, which must, therefore, be adroitly managed to present as much transitional surface as possible. This command of two elements must explain the power and charm of Plato. Art expresses the one, or the same by the different. Thought seeks to know unity in unity. Poetry to show it by variety, that is, always by an object or symbol. Plato keeps the two vases, one of ether and one of pigment, at his side, and invariably uses both. 
things added to things as statistics civil history are inventories things used as language are inexhaustibly attractive plato turns incessantly the obverse and the reverse of the medal of jove to take an example the physical philosophers have sketched each his theory of the world the theory of atoms of fire of flux of spirit theories mechanical and chemical in their genius plato a master of mathematics studious of all natural laws and causes feels these as second causes to be no theories of the world but bare inventories and lists to the study of nature he therefore prefixes the dogma let us declare the cause which led the supreme ordainer to produce and compose the universe he was good and he who is good has no kind of envy exempt from envy he wished that all things should be as much as possible like himself whosoever taught by wise men shall admit this as the prime cause of the origin and foundation of the world will be in the truth all things are for the sake of the good and it is the cause of everything beautiful this dogma animates and impersonates his philosophy the synthesis which makes the character of his mind appears in all his talents where there is great compass of wit we usually find excellencies that combine easily in the living man but in description appear incompatible the mind of plato is not to be exhibited by a chinese catalogue but is to be apprehended by an original mind in the exercise of its original power in him the freest abandonment is united with the precision of a geometer his daring imagination gives him the more solid grasp of facts as the birds of highest flight have the strongest aller bones his patrician polish his intrinsic elegance edged by an irony so subtle that it stings and paralyzes adorned the soundest health and strength of frame according to the old sentence if jove should descend to the earth he would speak in the style of plato with this palatial air there is for the direct aim of several of his works and running through the tenor of them all a certain earnestness which mounts in the republic and in the phaedo to piety he has been charged with feigning sickness at the time of the death of socrates but the anecdotes that have come down from the times attest his manly interference before the people in his master's behalf since even the savage cry of the assembly to plato is preserved and the indignation towards popular government in many of his pieces expresses a personal exasperation he has a probity a native reverence for justice and honour and a humanity which makes him tender for the superstitions of the people add to this he believes that poetry prophecy and the high insight arc from a wisdom of which man is not master that the gods never philosophize but by a celestial mania these miracles are accomplished horsed on these winged steeds he sweeps the dim regions visits worlds which flesh cannot enter he saw the souls in pain he hears the doom of the judge he beholds the penal metempsychosis the fates with the rock and shears and hears the intoxicating hum of their spindle but his circumspection never forsook him one would say he had read the inscription on the gates of Busrain, be bold and on the second gate be bold be bold and evermore be bold and then again he paused well at the third gate be not too bold his strength is like the momentum of a falling planet and his discretion the return of its due and perfect curve so excellent is his greek love of boundary and his skill in definition in reading logarithms one is not more secure than in following plato in his flights nothing can be colder than his head when the lightnings of his imagination are plain in the sky he has finished his thinking before he brings it to the reader and he abounds in the surprises of a literary master he has that opulence which furnishes 
at every turn, the precise weapon he needs. As the rich man wears no more garments, drives no more horses, sits in no more chambers than the poor, but has that one dress or equipage or instrument which is fit for the hour and the need, so Plato, in his plenty, is never restricted, but has the fit word. There is indeed no weapon in all the armory of wit which he did not possess and use. Epic, analysis, mania, intuition, music, satire, and irony, down to the customary and polite. His illustrations are poetry and his just illustrations. Socrates' profession of obstetric art is good philosophy, and his finding that word cookery and adulatory art for rhetoric in the Georges, does us of substantial service still. No order can measure an effect with him who can give good nicknames. What moderation and understatement, and checking his thunder in mid-volley! He has good-naturedly furnished the courtier and citizen with all that can be said against the schools. For philosophy is an elegant thing, if any one modestly meddles with it, but if he is conversant with it, more than is becoming, it corrupts the man. He could well afford to be generous. He, who from the sun-like centrality and reach of his vision, had a faith without cloud. Such as his perception was his speech. He plays with the doubt, and makes the most of it. He paints and quibbles, and by and by comes a sentence that moves the sea and land. The admirable earnest comes not only at intervals, in the perfect yes and no of the dialogue, but in bursts of light. I, therefore, Callicles, am persuaded by these accounts, and consider how I may exhibit my soul before the judge in a healthy condition. Wherefore, disregarding the honors that most men value, and looking to the truth, I shall endeavor in reality to live as virtuously as I can, and when I die, to die so. And I invite all other men, to the utmost of my power, and you too, I in turn invite to this contest, which, I affirm, surpasses all contests here. He is a great average man, one who, to the best thinking, adds a proportion and a quality in his faculties, so that men see in him their own dreams and glimpses made available, and made to pass for what they are. A great common sense is his warrant and qualification to be the world's interpreter. He has reason, as all the philosophic and poetic class have, but he is also what they have not, this strong solving sense to reconcile his poetry with the appearances of the world, and build a bridge from the streets of cities to the Atlantis. He omits never this graduation, but slopes his thought, however picturesque the precipice on one side, to an access from the plain. He never writes in ecstasy, or catches us up into poetic rapture. Plato apprehended the carnal facts. He could prostrate himself on the earth, and cover his eyes, whilst he adorned that which cannot be numbered, or gauged, or known, or named. That of which everything can be affirmed and denied. That which is entity and non-entity. He called it super-essential. He even stood ready, as in the Parmenides, to demonstrate that it was so, that this being exceeded the limits of intellect. No man ever more fully acknowledged the ineffable. Having paid his homage, as for the human race, to the illimitable, he then stood erect, and for the human race affirmed, and yet things are knowable. That is, the Asia in his mind was first heartily honored. The ocean of love and power, before form, before will, before knowledge, the same, the good, the one. And now, refreshed and empowered by this worship, the instinct of Europe, namely culture, returns, and he cries, Yet things are knowable. They are knowable because, being from one, things correspond. There is a scale, and the correspondence of heaven to earth, of matter to mind, of the part to the whole, is our guide. 
as there is a science of stars called astronomy a science of quantities called mathematics a science of qualities called chemistry so there is a science of sciences i call it dialectic which is the intellect discriminating the false and the true it rests on the observation of identity and diversity for to judge is to unite to an object the notion which belongs to it the sciences even the best mathematics and astronomy are like sportsmen who sees whatever prey offers even without being able to make any use of them dialectic must teach the use of them this is of that rank that no intellectual man will enter on any study for its own sake but only with a view to advance himself in that one sole science which embraces all the essence of peculiarity of man is to comprehend the whole or that which in the diversity of sensations can be comprised under a rational unity the soul which has never perceived the truth cannot pass into the human form i announce to men the intellect i announce the good of being interpenetrated by the mind that made nature this benefit namely that it can understand nature which it made and maketh nature is good but intellect is better as the lawgiver is before the law receiver i give you joy o sons of men that truth is altogether wholesome that we have hoped to search out what might be the very self of everything the misery of man is to be balked of the side of essence and to be stuffed with conjecture but the supreme good is reality the supreme beauty is reality and all virtue and all felicity depend on the science of the real for courage is nothing else than knowledge the fairest fortune that can befall man is to be guided by his demon to that which is truly his own this also is the essence of justice to attend every one his own nay the notion of virtue is not to be arrived at except through direct contemplation of the divine essence courage then for the persuasion that we must search that which we do not know will render us beyond comparison better braver and more industrious than if we thought it impossible to discover what we do not know and useless to search for it he secures a position not to be commanded by his passion for reality valuing philosophy only as it is the pleasure of conversing with real being thus full of the genius of europe he said culture he saw the institutions of sparta and recognized more genially one would say than any since the hope of education he delighted in every accomplishment and every graceful and useful and truthful performance above all in the splendors of genius and intellectual achievement the whole of life o socrates said glauco is with the wise the measure of hearing such discourses as these what a price he sets on the feats of talent on the powers of pericles of isocrates of parmenides what price above price on the talents themselves he called the several faculties gods in his beautiful personation what value he gives to the art of gymnastics in education what to geometry what to music what to astronomy whose appeasing and medicinal power he celebrates in the temsius he indicates the highest employment of the eyes by us it is asserted that god invented and bestowed sight on us for this purpose that on surveying the circles of intelligence in the heavens we might properly employ those of our own minds which though disturbed when compared with the others that are uniform are still allied to their circulations and that having thus learned and being naturally possessed of a correct reasoning faculty we might by imitating the uniform revolutions of divinity set right our own wanderings and blunders and in the republic by each of these disciplines a certain organ of the soul is both purified and reanimated 
which is blinded and buried by studies of another kind. An organ better worth saving than ten thousand eyes, since truth is perceived by this alone. He said culture, but he first admitted its basis, and gave immeasurably the first place to advantages of nature. His patrician tastes laid stress on the distinctions of birth, in the doctrine of the organic character, and disposition is the origin of caste, such as were fit to govern, into their composition, the informing deity mingled gold, into the military, silver, iron and brass for husbandmen and artificers. The East confirms itself, in all ages, in this faith. The Koran is explicit on this point of caste. Men have their metal, as of gold and silver. Those of you who were the worthy ones in the state of ignorance will be the worthy ones in the state of faith, as soon as you embrace it. Plato was not less firm. Of the five orders of things, only four can be taught in the generality of men. In the Republic, he insists on the temperaments of the youth, as the first of the first. A happier example of the stress laid on nature is in the dialogue with the young Theages, who wishes to receive lessons from Socrates. Socrates declares that, if some have grown wise by associating with him, no thanks are due to him, but simply, whilst they were with him, they grew wise, not because of him. He pretends not to know the way of it. It is adverse to many, nor can those be benefited by associating with me, whom the demons oppose, so that it is not possible for me to live with these. With many, however, he does not prevent me from conversing, who yet are not at all benefited by associating with me. Such, O Theages, is the association with me, for if it pleases the god, you will make great and rapid proficiency. You will not, if he does not please. Judge whether it is not safer to be instructed by some one of those who have power over the benefit which they impart to men, than by me, who benefit or not, just as it may happen. As if he had said, I have no system, I cannot be answerable for you, you will be what you must. If there is love between us, inconceivably delicious and profitable will our intercourse be. If not, your time is lost, and you will only annoy me. I shall seem to you stupid, and the reputation I have false. Quite above us, beyond the will of you or me, is this secret affinity or repulsion laid. All my good is magnetic, and I educate, not by lessons, but by going about my business. He said culture, he said nature, and he failed not to add, there was also the divine. There is no thought in any mind, but it quickly tends to convert itself into a power, and organizes a huge instrumentality of means. Plato, lover of limits, loved the illimitable, saw the enlargement and nobility which come from truth itself, and good itself, and attempted, as if on the part of the human intellect, once for all, to do it adequate homage, homage fit for the immense soul to receive, and yet homage becoming the intellect to render. He said then, Our faculties run out into infinity, and return to us thence. We can define but a little way. But here is a fact which will not be skipped, and which to shut our eyes upon is suicide. All things are in a scale, and, being where we will, ascend and ascend. All things are symbolical, and what we call results are beginnings. A key to the method and completeness of Plato is his twice bisected line. After he has illustrated the relation between the absolute good and true, and the forms of the intelligible world, he says, Let there be a line cut in two unequal parts. Cut again each of these two parts, one representing the visible, the other the intelligible world and these two new sections, representing the bright part and the dark part of these worlds, you will have, for one of the sections of the visible world, images, that is, both shadows and reflections. For the other section, the objects of these images, 
that is, plants, animals, and the works of art and nature. Then divide the intelligible world, in like manner. The one section will be of opinions and hypotheses, and the other section of truths. To these four sections, the four operations of the soul correspond, conjecture, faith, understanding, reason. As every pool reflects the image of the sun, so every thought and thing restores us an image and creature of the supreme good. The universe is perforated by a million channels for his activity. All things mount and mount. All his thought has this ascension in Phaedrus, teaching that beauty is the most lovely of all things, exciting hilarity, and shedding desire and confidence through the universe, wherever it enters. And it enters, in some degree, into all things, but that there is another, which is as much more beautiful than beauty, as beauty is than chaos, namely wisdom, which our wonderful organ of sight cannot reach into, but which, could it be seen, would ravish us with its perfect reality. He has the same regard to it as a source of excellence in works of art. When an artificer, in the fabrication of any work, looks to that which always subsists according to the same, and, employing a model of this kind, expresses its idea and power in his work, it must follow that his production should be beautiful. But when he beholds that which is born and dies, it will be far from beautiful. Thus ever, the banquet is a teaching in the same spirit, familiar now to all the poetry, and to all the sermons of the world, that the love of the sexes is initial, and symbolizes at a distance the passion of the soul for that immense lake of beauty it exists to seek. This faith in the divinity is never out of mind, and constitutes the limitation of all his dogmas. Body cannot teach wisdom, God only. In the same mind, he constantly affirms that virtue cannot be taught, that it is not a science, but an inspiration, that the greatest goods are produced to us through mania, and are assigned to us by a divine gift. This leads me to that central figure which he has established in his academy, as the organ through which every considered opinion shall be announced, and whose biography he has likewise so labored, that the historic facts are lost in the light of Plato's mind. Socrates and Plato are the double star, which the most powerful instruments will not entirely separate. Socrates, again, in his traits and genius, is the best example of that synthesis which constitutes Plato's extraordinary power. Socrates, a man of humble stem, but honest enough, of the commonest history, of a personal homeliness so remarkable as to be a cause of wit in others. The rather that his broad good nature and exquisite taste for a joke invited the sally, which was sure to be paid. The players personated him on the stage, the potters copied his ugly face on their stone jugs. He was a cool fellow, adding to his humor a perfect temper and a knowledge of his man, be he who he might, whom he talked with, which laid the companion open to certain defeat in any debate, and in debate he immoderately delighted. The young men are prodigiously fond of him, and invite him to their feasts, whither he goes for conversation. He can drink, too, has the strongest head in Athens, and, after leaving the whole party under the table, goes away, as if nothing had happened, to begin new dialogues with somebody that is sober. In short, he was what our country people call an old one. He affected a good many citizen-like tastes, was monstrously fond of Athens, hated trees, never willingly went beyond the walls, knew the old characters, valued the boars and philistines, thought everything in Athens a little better than anything in any other place. He was plain as a Quaker in habit and speech, affected low phrases, and illustrations from cocks and quails, soup pans and sycamore spoons, grooms and farriers, and unnameable offices, especially if he talked with any superfine person. He had a Franklin-like wisdom, 
Thus, he showed one who was afraid to go on foot to Olympia, that it was no more than his daily walk within doors, if continuously extended, would easily reach. Plain old uncle, as he was, with his great ears, an immense talker, the rumor ran that on one or two occasions in the war with Boeotia, he had shown a determination which had covered the retreat of a troop. And there was some story that, under cover of folly, he had, in the city of government, when one day he chanced to hold a seat there, evinced a courage in opposing singly the popular voice, which had well-nigh ruined him. He is very poor, but then he is hardy as a soldier, and can live on a few olives, usually in the strictest sense, on bread and water, except when entertained by his friends. His necessary expenses were exceedingly small, and no one could live as he did. He wore no undergarment. His upper garment was the same for summer and winter, and he went barefooted, and it is said that, to procure the pleasure, which he loves, of talking at his ease all day with the most elegant and cultivated young men, he will now and then return to his shop and carve statues, good or bad, for sale. However that be, it is certain that he had grown to delight in nothing else than this conversation, and that, under his hypocritical pretense of knowing nothing, he attacks and brings down all the fine speakers, all the fine philosophers of Athens, whether natives or strangers from Asia Minor and the islands. Nobody can refuse to talk with him. He is so honest, and really curious to know. A man who was willingly confuted, if he did not speak the truth, and who willingly confuted others, asserting what was false, and not less pleased when confuted than when confuting for he thought not any evil happened to men, of such a magnitude as false opinion respecting the just and unjust. A pitiless disputant, who knows nothing, but the bounds of whose conquering intelligence no man had ever reached, whose temper was imperturbable, whose dreadful logic was always leisurely and sportive, so careless and ignorant as to disarm the weariest, and draw them in, in the pleasantest manner, into horrible doubts and confusion. But he always knew the way out, knew it, yet would not tell it. No escape, he drives them to terrible choices by his dilemmas, and tosses the Hippiases and Gorgiases, and their grand reputations, as a boy tosses his balls. The tyrannous realist, Menno, has discoursed a thousand times, at length, on virtue, before many companies, and very well as it appeared to him. But at this moment he cannot even tell what it is. This crampfish of a Socrates has so bewitched him. This hard-headed humorist, whose strange conceits, drollery and bon ami, diverted the young patricians, whilst the rumor of his sayings and quibbles gets abroad every day, turns out, in a sequel, to have a property as invincible as his logic, and to be either insane, or at least, under cover of this play, enthusiastic in his religion. When accused before the judges of subverting the popular creed, he affirms the immortality of the soul, the future reward and punishment, and refusing to recant, in a caprice of the popular government, was condemned to die, and sent to the prison. Socrates entered the prison, and took away all ignominy from the place, which could not be a prison, whilst he was there. Credo bribed the jailer, but Socrates would not go out by treachery. Whatever inconvenience ensue, nothing is to be preferred before justice. These things I hear like pipes and drums, whose sound makes me deaf to everything you say. The fame of this prison the fame of the discourses there, and the drinking of the hemlock, are one of the most precious passages in the history of the world. The rare coincidence in one ugly body, of the droll and the martyr, the keen street and market debater, with the sweetest saint known to any history at the time, had forcibly struck the mind of Plato, so capacious of these contrasts, and the figure of Socrates, by necessity, placed itself in the foreground of the scene, 
as the fittest dispenser of the intellectual treasures he had to communicate, it was a rare fortune that this Esau of the mob, and this robe scholar, should meet to make each other immortal in their mutual faculty. The strange synthesis in the character of Socrates capped the synthesis in the mind of Plato. Moreover, by this means, he was able, in the direct way, and without envy, to avail himself of the wit and weight of Socrates, to which unquestionably his own debt was great, and these derived again their principal advantage from the perfect art of Plato. It remains to say that the defect of Plato in power is only that which results inevitably from his quality. He is intellectual in his aim, and therefore, in expression, literary, mounting into heaven, driving into the pit, expounding the laws of the state, the passion of love, the remorse of crime, the hope of the parting soul. He is literary, and never otherwise. It is almost the sole deduction from the merit of Plato that his writings have not, what is no doubt, incident to this regnancy of intellect in his work, the vital authority which the screams of prophets and the sermons of unlettered Arabs and Jews possess. There is an interval, and to cohesion, contact is necessary. I know not what can be said in reply to this criticism, but that we have come to a fact in the nature of things. An oak is not an orange. The qualities of sugar remain with sugar, and those of salt with salt. In the second place, he has not a system. The dearest defenders and disciples are at fault. He attempted a theory of the universe, and this theory is not complete or self-evident. One man thinks he means this, and another, that. He has said one thing in one place, and the reverse of it in another place. He is charged with having failed to make the transition from ideas to matter. Here is the world, sound as a nut, perfect, not the smallest piece of chaos left, never a stitch nor an end, not a mark of haste or botching or second thought. But the theory of the world is a thing of shreds and patches. The longest wave is quickly lost in the sea. Plato would willingly have a Platonism, a known and accurate expression for the world, and it should be accurate. It shall be the world passed through the mind of Plato, nothing less. Every atom shall have the platonic tinge, every atom, every relation or quality you knew before, you shall know again and find here, but now ordered, not nature but art. And you shall feel that Alexander indeed overran, with men and horses, some countries of the planet, but countries and things of which countries are made, elements, planet itself, laws of planet and of men, have passed through this man as bread into his body, and become no longer bread, but body. So while this mammoth morsel has become Plato, he has clapped copyright on the world. This is the ambition of individualism. But the mouthful proves too large. Bow constrictor has good will to eat it, but he is foiled. He falls abroad in the attempt, and biting gets strangled. The bitten world holds the biter fast, by his own teeth. There he perishes, unconquered nature lives on and forgets him. So it fares with all, so must it fare with Plato. In view of eternal nature, Plato turns out to be philosophical exercitations. He argues on this side and on that. The acutest German, the lovingest disciple, could never tell what Platonism was. Indeed, admirable texts can be quoted on both sides of every great question from him. These things we are forced to say, if we must consider the effort of Plato, or of any philosopher, to dispose of nature, which will not be disposed of. No power of genius has ever yet had the smallest success in explaining existence. The perfect enigma remains. But there is an injustice in assuming this ambition for Plato. Let us not seem to treat with flippancy his venerable name. Men, in proportion to their intellect, have admitted his transcendent claims. The way to know him is to compare him not with nature, but with other men. How many ages have gone by, 
and he remains unapproached. A chief structure of human wit, like Karnak, or the medieval cathedrals, or the Etrurian remains, it requires all the breath of human faculty to know it. I think it is truly a scene, when seen with the most respect. His sense deepens, his merits multiply with study. When we say, here is a fine collection of fables, or when we praise the style, or the common sense, or arithmetic, we speak as boys, and much of our impatient criticism of the dialectic, I suspect, is no better. The criticism is like our impatience of miles when we are in a hurry, but it is still best that a mile should have seventeen hundred and sixty yards. The great-eyed Plato proportioned the lights and shades after the genius of our life. End chapter 2 Plato or the Philosopher Chapter 2 Continued Plato, New Readings, of Representative Men, by Ralph Waldo Emerson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 The publication in Mr. Bond's Serial Library of the excellent translations of Plato, which we esteem one of the chief benefits the cheap press has yielded, gives us an occasion to take hastily a few more notes of the elevation and bearings of this fixed star or to add a bulletin, like the journals, of Plato at the latest dates. Modern science, by the extent of its generalization, has learned to indemnify the student of man for the defects of individuals, by tracing growth and ascent in races, and by the simple expedient of lighting up the vast background, generates a feeling of complacency and hope. The human being has the saurian and the plant in his rear. His arts and sciences, the easy issue of his brain, look glorious when prospectively beheld from the distant brain of ox, crocodile, and fish. It seems as if nature, in regarding the geologic night behind her, when in five or six millenniums she had turned out five or six men, as Homer, Phidias, Menu, and Columbus, was nowise discontented with the result. These samples attested the virtue of the tree. These were a clear amelioration of trilobite and saurus, and a good basis for further proceeding. With this artist time and space are cheap, and she is insensible of what you say of tedious preparation. She rated tranquilly the flowing periods of paleontology, for the hour to be struck when man should arrive. Then periods must pass before the motion of the earth can be suspected, then before the map of the instincts and the cultivable powers can be drawn. But as of races, so the succession of individual men is fatal and beautiful, and Plato has the fortune, in the history of mankind, to mark an epoch. Plato's fame does not stand on a syllogism, or on any masterpieces of the Socratic, or in any thesis, as, for example, the immortality of the soul. He is more than an expert, or a schoolman, or a geometer, or the prophet of a peculiar message. He represents the privilege of the intellect, the power, namely, of carrying up every fact to successive platforms, and so disclosing, in every fact, a germ of expansion. These expansions are in the essence of thought. The naturalist would never help us to them by any discoveries of the extent of the universe, but is as poor when cataloguing the resolved nebula of Orion, as when measuring the angles of an acre. But the Republic of Plato, by these expansions, may be said to require and so to anticipate the astronomy of Laplace. The expansions are organic. The mind does not create what it perceives any more than the eye creates the rose. In ascribing to Plato the merit of announcing them, we only say, here was a more complete man, who could apply to nature the whole scale of the senses, the understanding and the reason. 
These expansions or extensions consist in continuing the spiritual sight where the horizon falls on our natural vision, and by the second sight discovering the long lines of law which shoot in every direction. Everywhere he stands on a path which has no end, but runs continuously round the universe. Therefore every word becomes an exponent of nature. Whatever he looks upon discloses a second sense and ulterior senses. His perception of the generation of contraries, of death out of life and life out of death, that law by which in nature decomposition is recomposition, and putrefaction and cholera are only signals of a new creation. His discernment of the little in the large and the large in the small, studying the state in the citizen and the citizen in the state, and leaving it doubtful whether he exhibited the republic as an allegory on the education of the private soul. His beautiful definitions of ideas, of time, of form, a figure, of the line, sometimes hypothetically given, as his defining of virtue, courage, justice, temperance, his love of the apologue, and his apologues themselves, the cave of Trophonius, the ring of Gyges, the charioteer, and two horses, the golden, silver, brass, and iron temperaments, Theuth and Famous, and the visions of Hades and the Fates. Fables which have imprinted themselves in the human memory, like the signs of the zodiac. His soliform eye and his boniform soul, his doctrine of assimilation, his doctrine of reminiscence, his clear vision of the laws of return or reaction, which secure instant justice throughout the universe instanced everywhere but specially in the doctrine what comes from god to us returns from us to god and in socrates belief that the laws below are sisters of the laws above more striking examples are his moral conclusions plato affirms the coincidence of science and virtue for vice can never know itself and virtue but virtue knows both itself and vice. The eye attested that justice was best as long as it was profitable. Plato affirms that it is profitable throughout, that the profit is intrinsic, though the just conceal his justice from gods and men, that it is better to suffer injustice than to do it, that the sinner ought to covet punishment, that the lie was more hurtful than homicide, and that ignorance, or the involuntary lie, was more calamitous than involuntary homicide, that the soul is unwillingly deprived of true opinions, and that no man sins willingly, that the order of proceeding of nature was from the mind to the body, and, though a sound body cannot restore an unsound mind, yet a good soul can, by its virtue, render the body the best possible. The intelligent have a right over the ignorant, namely, the right of instructing them. The right punishment of one out of tune is to make him play in tune. The fine which the good, refusing to govern, ought to pay, is to be governed by a worse man. That his guard shall not handle gold and silver, but shall be instructed that there is gold and silver in their souls, which will make men willing to give them everything which they need. This second sight explains the stress laid on geometry. He saw that the globe of earth was not more lawful and precise than was the supersensible, that a celestial geometry was in place there, as the logic of lines and angles here below, that the world was throughout mathematical, the proportions are constant of oxygen, azote, and lime. There is just so much water in slate and magnesia. Not less are the proportions constant of moral elements. This eldest Goethe, hating varnish and falsehood, delighted in revealing the real at the base of the accidental, in discovering connection, continuity, and representation everywhere, hating insulation, 
and appears like the god of wealth among the cabins of vagabonds, opening power and capability in everything he touches. Ethical science was new and vacant when Plato could write thus. Of all whose arguments are left to the men of the present time, no one has ever yet condemned injustice, or praised justice, otherwise than as respects the repute, honors, and emoluments arising therefrom, while as respects either of them in itself, and subsisting by its own power in the soul of the possessor, and concealed both from gods and men, no one is yet sufficiently investigated, either in poetry or prose writings. How, namely, that the one is the greatest of all the evils that the soul has within it, and justice the greatest good. His definition of ideas as what is simple, permanent, uniform, and self-existent, forever discriminating them from the notions of the understanding, marks an error in the world. He was born to behold the self-evolving power of spirit, endless generator of new ends, a power which is the key at once to the centrality and the evanescence of things. Plato is so centered that he can well spare all his dogmas. Thus the fact of knowledge and ideas reveals to him the fact of eternity, and the doctrine of reminiscence he offers as the most probable particular explication. Call that fanciful, it matters not. The connection between our knowledge and the abyss of being is still real, and the explication must be not less magnificent. He has indicated every eminent point in speculation. He wrote on the scale of the mind itself, so that all things have symmetry in his tablet. He put in all the past, without weariness, and descended into detail, with a courage like that he witnessed in nature. One would say that his forerunners had mapped out each a farm or a district or an island in intellectual geography, but that Plato first drew the sphere. He domesticates the soul in nature. Man is the microcosm. All the circles of the visible heaven represent as many circles in the rational soul. There is no lawless particle and there is nothing casual in the action of the human mind. The names of things, too, are fatal, following the nature of things. All the gods of the pantheon are, by their names, significant of a profound sense. The gods are the ideas, Pan is speech or manifestation, Saturn the contemplative, Jove the regal soul, and Mars passion. Venus is proportion, Calliope, the soul of the world, Aglaea, intellectual illustration. These thoughts, in sparkles of light, had appeared often to pious and to poetic souls, but this well-bred, all-knowing Greek geometer comes with command, gathers them all up into rank and gradation, the Euclid of holiness, and marries the two parts of nature. Before all men he saw the intellectual values of the moral sentiment. He describes his own ideals when he paints in Timaeus a god leading things from disorder into order. He kindled a fire so truly in the center that we see the sphere illuminated, and can distinguish poles, equator, and lines of latitude, every arc and node. A theory so averaged, so modulated, that you would say, the winds of ages had swept through this rhythmic structure, and not that it was the brief extempore blotting of one short-lived scribe. Hence it has happened that a very well-marked class of souls, namely those who delight in giving a spiritual, that is, an ethico-intellectual expression, to every truth by exhibiting an ulterior end, which is yet legitimate to it, are said to platonize. Thus, Michelangelo is a Platonist. In his sonnets, Shakespeare is a Platonist. When he writes, Nature is made better by no mean, but nature makes that mean, or He that can endure to follow with allegiance a fallen lord does conquer him that did his master conquer, and earns a place in the story. 
Hamlet is a pure Platonist, and tis the magnitude only of Shakespeare's proper genius that hinders him from being classed as the most eminent of this school. Swedenborg, throughout his prose poem of conjugal love, is a Platonist. His subtlety commended him to men of thought. The secret of his popular success is the moral aim which endeared him to mankind. Intellect, he said, is king of heaven and of earth. But in Plato, intellect is always moral. His writings have also the sempiternal youth of poetry. For their arguments, most of them, might have been couched in sonnets. And poetry has never soared higher than in the Timaeus and the Phaedrus. As the poet, too, he is only contemplative. He did not, like Pythagoras, break himself with an institution. All his painting in the Republic must be esteemed mythical, with intent to bring out, sometimes in violent colors, his thought. You cannot institute without peril of charlatan. It was a high scheme, his absolute privilege for the best, which to make emphatic he expressed by community of women, as the premium which he would set on grandeur. There shall be exempts of two kinds. First, those who by demerit have put themselves below protection, outlaws. And secondly, those who by eminence of nature and desert are out of the reach of your rewards. Let such be free of the city and above the law. We confide them to themselves. Let them do with us as they will. Let none presume to measure the irregularities of Michelangelo and Socrates by village scales. In his eighth book of the Republic, he throws a little mathematical dust in our eyes. I am sorry to see him, after such noble superiorities, permitting the lie to governors. Plato plays providence a little with the baser sort, as people allow themselves with their dogs and cats. End chapter 2 Plato New Readings